Hello and welcome to the second video of the night time of year, our journey course, if you will. I love a good journey rather than a course, perhaps. Um, so yes, apologies if this is coming out a little later than I expected. I had totally lapsed on the fact that here in the UK that last night was bonfire night, which involves a lot of fireworks. And every time I went down, to, every, every time I sat down to record this, there was a robust uh, explosion next door to me. So um, anyway, we might still hear some... Uh, last bits of, of fireworks going off and I don't think that's such a big deal but it has quieted down just a little bit. Um, so some of you might have noticed I recently did a couple of things I'm trying to spread the word that you know and maybe it's a cheeky way to talk about it but that Halloween isn't over yet and I think that uh, you know it's not precisely you know the, what I'm trying to get across but I think it is the most to the point of what it what it is that I really want us to sit with around this time, which is that we, most of us, probably many of you, at least myself, and many of you are pro probably do live within areas of the world that are very influenced by um, capitalist consumerism, and not to make this into any particular kind of, of commentary around that. I think that there, there are others who are way better qualified to speak to it than I am. But I do think that there's something that we often are uh, not aware of, which is um, the commercialization of time, and particularly the commercialization of festivals, in that, you know, in the supermarkets here, our shops, you know, the there's an aisle that's like a seasonal aisle. And on that seasonal aisle already since, I would say, the start of October, there was already Halloween and Christmas stuff like there on that aisle. And the moment uh, that Halloween, as in October 31st, comes to an end, you know, everything about its presence sort of is erased you know, it disappears because the now we're gearing up for what is the thing that, that, or at least they are gearing up for what is the thing that they can sell us, what is the thing that they can make a profit off of. And now that that time has supposedly ended, is over, it's now time to move on to the next thing to get people more amped up. So I'm always interested in this, how, you know, paying attention to at least the places I've lived, uh, and this is something that I also want to get across, and it is very much about the places that you live, but October, because it ends in Halloween, is often given this um, spooky season kind of label, when in all actuality, you know, the end of October is the gateway into winter. And I think you can see it in something like the Irish names for the months, where um, the entire month of November is called Samhain. And the fact that the month itself carries that name should signal to us that this entire month is really, if not all of winter, really, which is for them would have been uh, in that, that tradition is November, December, and January, the idea that that entire time of the, the darker portion of the year, when it is really approaching its darkest, and then just barely creeping out of the dark again, is, is an entire time to really have an extended encounter, as I've said before, with the dead, with the spirits of the land, and with all those things that come alive in the night. So I hope that some of this is starting to sink in for you, because I want us to really resist uh, the commercialization of time, and sort of reestablish the importance that this time holds within, uh, within the pattern uh, of the place that we're in, and within the pattern of, the, of our life. And that being said, I want us to, a lot of times when we think of place, we think of only the land, you know, what in maybe uh, the earth, 
country, if you will. Um, and something that I think is really interesting is to realize that y your place is not just the land, it's also the sky. You know, that there's a very special relationship between the sky and the place that you're in and the land. And I want us to continue to sit with these relationships as we go further. That um, a lot of what I want you to be able to do is, yes, we're drawing from very different areas of the world and thinking about uh, what people have thought before or think contemporarily about going into the dark and then my own ideas, you know, that I'm trying to share with you. But at the same time, I think it's super important it's maybe even more important that you uh, be uh, like your place, you know, that you start to learn to have that genius, that intelligence that really comes out of being in relationship with the place that you are specifically in. And we might say also the places that are part, that you're tangled with, you know, that's the question I asked on the intake. What places are you tangled with? Because I think that this will show the sort of many and multifaceted relationship that we have with place. But in particular, the place that you are in right now while you're listening to this, realizing that the sky is also part of the place. You know, it's not something we often sit with. So we'll come to that in in later moments or in, in a later video. But I wanted to really look at how the actions of what we think of as winter and where we're headed right now for those of us in the north. And for those of you in the south, you know, you're headed towards summer. Um, something I would say is that the actions seem to be twofold there in terms of going towards the dark and the colder time of year, which is that the team seems to be both uh, a moving inwards and towards the warmth and the closeness that we can feel within the interior warm space. And then from this, almost like from the safety and security of that central warmth, we then have a kind of stamina or we have a strength to then go out into the dark and explore it more. You know, so it's almost like when I think about it, when I think about a couple of the analogies that I often sit with around this time is that of sap of the tree and how as it gets colder, the sap moves closer to the core of the tree. And then also a lot of energy at that time is channeled down into the roots of the tree. Similarly for us, if you watch what human beings tend to do around the darker winter months, is we draw closer to the interior spaces of our homes. And a lot of times there's more of us in those spaces. And if we think about various arrangements that we have and have had with, with other people, but also other non-human people, where all of those people, people, human people and non-human people would be in the same enclosure, you know, the same house, and how much the importance of the hearth really plays at that time, at this time. And now lots of us have only lived, when I grew, when I was a child, I grew up, there were lots of places that I lived that did have fireplaces, uh, but I've only lived um, as an adult a few times in places that had a, a hearth. And one of those was in when I lived in, in Edinburgh. And while I was in Edinburgh, there it, it became an important thing for me to understand, you know, what how the fire was within that space. And I remember um, we had a young kitten. And I remember the first time she ever saw fire in 
our hearth. And it was an amazing thing to witness because she was absolutely transfixed. She would sit there on the edge of the, of the fire uh, place and she would stare for endless amounts of time till she would even fall asleep, like right there, just looking into the fire. And even when the fire was not there, when the hearth was not lit, she would go back there waiting to to meet this god that lived in, in this fireplace, you know. And I think that we've all had that experience where we have seen the true power and captivating quality that fire is able to bring. And that's something I would like us to tap into a little bit when we're thinking about what it means to light and tend the hearth fire. Um, because we don't tend to let that go out, you know, and something I, I wanted to bring us back to as well around this is the idea that a lot of times with the way that we experience getting colder, we experience like a loss of heat. We feel like heat is getting out when in all actuality, you know, it's really cold is getting in and and it's because of that cold getting in that we do really need to go to that deeper, more interior place with this heat, because the deeper and the warmer it is on the inside, you know, the less the ability of the cold is able to penetrate it. And similarly, you know, that being a theme, you know, when we're lighting the hearth fire, it already draws very interesting things into into focus, such as the shadow. You know, when the light, is, when it's dark and there is a central light source, the presence of shadow becomes so much more apparent and the overlapping of shadow. And something that I'd like you to explore, you know, at some point when you have a moment. And with fire, it's always important that you uh, take care. So not all of us have very safe places to have a fire, a lot, you know, lit all the time. Um, and 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 even when we're working with fire, a naked flame, you always do want to take extra care around your 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 work with naked flames but when possible for you find a way within as much space as you can to light a single candle in the middle of that space and spend some time really looking at the flame you know the the single flame and how much in darkness the way in which a flame becomes this most luxurious, most inviting nighttime being, you know, um, the way that it interacts with the, the space around it and start to take notice of the shadow that you cast and attending to that shadow, paying attention to it, almost like seeing what it has to, to say to you. And I, I would like to keep this playful and invitational, you know, rather than us immediately go to um, an inherently psychoanalytic place around what the shadow might be able to present and represent, but more like a shadow as an opportunity to understand an other form of self that is tied to you that you can learn to actually dance with. And what happens if the shadow is the thing that that initiates the movement uh, of, of what we think of as the thing that is actually responsible for the shadow, which is the body. Uh, I'd like you to, to do this at some point and see, see what comes up for you. And similarly, you know, something that I wanted to draw attention to uh, is something that I'm taking from Tyson Yonkaporta, who is a really amazing Aboriginal author who, who's written a book called Sand Talk. And if you've never had a chance to read it, it is one of my favorite books. I think I've read it three times now. I'm trying to m make my way through it a fourth time. But he talks about something called Ancestor Mind. And what I find really interesting and something that can come 
alive for us while say doing a practice like this where we're attending so readily to the qualities of light when we're in a room with a single candle flame lit or around a hearth fire um, or a campfire that we can go into the state we're so fully engaged with presence uh, that we're able to touch high levels of knowledge and an engagement that is attained through an intense state of attending to what is right before us. And in doing this, we start to have this experience where some of these, um, the, the knowledge that is able to come through at that time really speaks to a level that has to do with muscle memory, cellular memory, we might even say bone memory, that it goes back deeper than, than, a nor than, than we often might pay attention to. And to me, this is an interesting thought because uh, similarly to some of the work I've done with Alkisis Dymek around movement and dance and the body, is that these darker realms like the body, they are a fundamental ground of our being. And this is something I want to speak to today. But the idea of when we allow ourselves to have such presence with shadow and with our own body, there's something else that is able to step forward. And it's almost like all the forms that we have ever been in terms of our ancestors. And I mean, as human persons and as non-human persons is still present within us. And by being able to tap into the this dark sense of the body, these memories or, yeah, the memory of it, the ancestor mind is able to really step forward um, in, in these states. You know, so when we're intensely concentrated, intensely present, and full of presence, this ancestor mind takes over very readily. And I think that anyone who's ever, say, for example, cared for young children for extended periods of time, there are moments where you just go into it. It's not something that you have to even be told what to do or how to do it. It just is what we do. And rather, you know, I think it's something to really pay attention to where uh, what what mo what movements and what uh, activities take us into ancestor mind. And Tyson Young Caporta, he sort of he emphasizes uh, craft and and activities that really create um, high levels of concentration. But what I'd like you to sit with is this idea that if you are attending to the light that is cast by that flame and the way in which shadow and light are able to start to dance with one another, the way in which your own shadow can become like a, a another self that one can interact with. And just keep it as playful as you can. You know, keep it as joyful as you can in terms of joyfully attending, turning to face that and see what comes up. Um, and uh, this, yes, there's a couple things I want to mention that are about this, but, you know, as we deepen our attention to attending to the darkness, and anytime I ever say attend, I do mean pay attention but it also means something deeper than that, like allowing awareness to be focused on something. Um, for me, presence, learning to inhabit fuller states of presence within place is a lot of the magic that is involved with this. And a lot of it is, is happening through the power of attending to something. And so when we start to attend to darkness, we also start to pay attention to the forms that are created by the dark. Um, and I think that an interesting example of this is there within certain Mesoamerican cultures and many cultures where there's a lot, a, a lot less humidity in the air to sort of not allow the high contrasts of the black to sort of be present in the sky. 
But anyone who's ever had a chance to see um, the Milky Way across the sky, which I haven't for many years now, but I grew up seeing it for sure, where I grew up in southern Alabama. And um, what we'll notice is that our mind tends to be drawn to the light, you know, tends to be drawn to the sources sources of light, the nodes, if you will, or these sort these cloudy sort of milky uh, bit uh, milky presence of light, you know, that's sort of there. But in an area that's very dark and often very dry, you will also see a, a rift that sort of moves like a dark river that is moving in between these more luminous parts of the sky. And it's interesting to know that this darkness is something that several, many cultures, such as the Maya, have attended to it and to the fact that they would actually say, you know, that they were different animal forms that were there by the uh, river of the Milky Way, and sometimes even referred to, you know, there's very, there's an important stuff, important information there around the galactic center, and in terms of where uh, our own Milky Way galaxy is sort of orientating itself towards the middle of the Milky Way galaxy, there's a darkness that is there, and the reason that darkness is there is, is due to the high level of, 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 of matter within that space so dense that it obscures the, the luminous uh, quality that is behind it. It actually blocks it. It forms like these dark clouds that are there. And so I say all this to say that a lot can come from starting to pay attention to this. And so when you, next time you have a chance to look out at the night sky, you know, your eye might be drawn to really bright things because the uh, winter sky for us in the north uh, and for when it's winter for you in the south, you're able to see so much more of the sky for so much longer. And uh, sky watching really does become like its own thing in the winter time. So when you're next out in a dark sky, what would happen if you shift your attention not just to the, the nodes of light that, we, that are the, the stars and the wandering stars, the planets? What if we also started to attend to the dark space that is sort of between the stars? And, and the shapes of darkness that we start to pay attention to, and almost seeing what happens if within that state of presence and an openness, a receptivity, if you were to be present with the darkness that's there and see what comes to you, you know, see what comes. Maybe by attending to it, you know, uh, we can see, just like I said, when we close our eyes, the darkness that's there, it can be a screen for the projection of our mind. It can also be a space for other things to communicate to us, but it can also be an opening, a doorway, a portal, you know, or a dark mirror. Um, I'm interested in this idea. And I'm interested to see what happens when you do this, you know, and I, again, always wish for you that you're able to suspend and or use your fear in a way that heightens your experience rather than one that uh, maybe it makes it not possible to be involved. But it's always invitational. I want you to feel like you're being invited to do this. Um, and you don't have to do everything. No one person has to do everything. You just do do what you will. It'll sit sit with you until the time is right, I'm sure. So turning a little bit more to the mystic aspect of what I want to focus on in this talk and, and the idea of the metaphysics of the night, um, a couple things I want to introduce is that some people have tried to imagine what uh, a medieval European person might have thought about the color of, of space, you know, if you will, because for us, we have a very uh, sort of 
mm, headed towards entropy, like losing its ability to stay warm and everything's fading into darkness and, um, you know, <laughs> sense of space being like vacuous and empty when in many ways there are places that are called voids within space where there's very little matter but most of it of course has matter within it um but you know my understanding is that for um a medieval European person, if you were to say, what is the true color of space or the out there, there's actually a luminous quality to it. So it would be, you know, the only reason we ever saw the sky as being black was because we were turned away from the luminous things and we're seeing like the smaller luminous things that are present in that moment because we're in the shadow. And it's true. It's very true. We are in the shadow of the earth at that moment. You know, we are part of the dark side of the earth at that moment, whenever we are in the dark. And I think a lot can be learned by paying attention to the transition periods towards uh, the deep dark. Because anything, something I know from my work with an astrology that I do think is interesting, and there will be a whole video thinking about this, and I have a couple of uh, bits that I will bring in during this video. But the idea that, you know, day is really marked by the presence of the sun visibly on the horizon, and it's showing itself. So at dawn, when the, when the sun actually cracks open the horizon, if you will, at that moment and it rises up, um, we are in the day. And it, it, it uh, carves an arc across the heavens and then begins to make its way down. And the day ends when the sun's light, is, the sun itself is gone. You know, once it is fully set, night sets in and night almost holds this is an interesting thing about nighttime is nighttime holds both the dusky nest pre-dawn and also the twilight phase of uh, the recently set sun and so there is like this great amount of visual texture that nighttime offers where there's a transition you know and if we think about the metaphysics of night and day and a lot of the ways in which various uh, astrologies do think about um, the the power of the night and the power of the day is like the breath you know that the day is an inhalation and that the night is an exhalation. And we can find this by paying attention to our own breath. You know that if the day is the inhalation, day has begun as soon as the air is entering into our nose. You know, it's like the sun has made its appearance there. And then the moment that uh, day ends um, is the moment that we reach that kind of like peak breath in. And the moment that that stops, day is done, you know, the transitions, those in between breath and in breath and out breath is almost part of the night. And I think that paying attention to the transition into the deep, deep dark uh, is a lot like attending to those in those spaces that are sort of there in between the the transition moment between the in-breath and the out-breath uh, and the out-breath back to the in-breath and slowing this down we can start to notice this so I almost I, I think that it's an interesting one as we breathe to sort of think about the day and then to think about the night and the exhalation being real then those transitions being tied to the energy of the night, and we think about this in uh, 
we'll return to some of this thought in a moment. But it's it's similar to some of the same things we said about the drawing inwards, you know, that there is this movement back back towards the interior, um, almost like it's like a like an expanding and a contracting. And that's very true in the way that we think about the heat that the day offers and the dryness. So it has like an expanding quality and night brings coolness and moisture. There's a condensing that starts to happen. And this is mirrored out, mirrored in a lot of relationships in many different um, mystical traditions, as well as how they how different mystical traditions think about the way that energy moves, uh, the way that forces are sort of interacting with one another. So the night is that power of the transition, but also of the... Yes, the drawing inwards, the condensing. So again, thinking about it from uh, some metaphysical and also maybe story uh, dynamics. Thinking about darkness as the uh, prime primal ground of being. Um, and I think there's an interesting way that we could think about this. If we were to look at um, the work of Hesiod, which gives some of the earliest known um, versions of creation within uh, the world that we think of as the Greek world, um, we see that first and foremost, there is uh, a chaos. And that chaos can be personified as an abyss or a void, uh, almost like uh, it often thought of within that tradition as being like a formless confusion. There's not really anything that is able to be manifest in the way that we normally think of it. And and this does highlight some of the dispositions that those that tradition has towards darkness, for sure. But chaos was not darkness to them. It was like a pre-existing state, you know, if you will. And out of this void comes Nyx, which is night. And Iberus comes out of it as well next and that is darkness and then next we have eros and gaia and tartarus you know they it's like an order almost but in this way we do see that uh from void comes night and darkness they're the first you know to to be there on in this this uh version of the of a of an origin story, and eros is the thing that came comes in that makes it possible for two things to yoke together and make something new, and so by uberus, uh, which is thought of as a as a as a male deity, darkness, uh, Nyx, who is thought of as a female deity, um, give birth to uh, ether or the upper head or the upper air, if you will, and then to Humera, which is daytime or the day. And this was the first uh, union was actually between darkness and night. And they are the ones that give birth to air and to uh, or the upper heaven, if you will, and to um, to day. And I think that uh, this is an interesting one because from Nyx herself, uh, she becomes the mother of several other forms like uh, Thatanatos, which is translated as death, or Moros, which is translated as doom, but also Hypnos, which is sleep. But she also gives birth unto herself to the fates or the morai and to a being that we think of as something that is sort of like a another version of fate uh, called nemesis. So night, um, 
Knight has this generative quality in and of herself, and this is not uncommon of several other of several other forms. But I do like this idea of how void, night, and darkness are more aligned with the void because they are first, and then from night and darkness, they yoke, and the offspring that comes from them is uh, is the upper heaven. And, and day. And so it's like day is actually arising out of night. And uh, it's, again, sticks to that idea of what I'm saying, of darkness and nighttime really being able to hold, hold down the um, primal ground, you know, of being, if you will. But there are lots of different creation stories. It's just one that kind of vibes with the, the message that I'm trying to bring across. So I'd like to read to you now um, the uh, poem from the Orphic Hymns, uh, Tonight. It's a prayer tonight. And I uh, will have a PDF of this underneath somewhere, underneath this video, um, if you're on my site. And if you're not, go there and you'll be able to see it. It'll be right there. So um, this is the prayer tonight. And the incense was to burn what is called dalos, uh, also translated as firebrands. And it's just a, it's a form, we think at least, it's a form of aromatic wood. And this is uh, from the Orphic Hymns, um, named from, uh, given like kind of credit to, to Orpheus. Um, the shaman sage, if you will, musician, poet, um, and also uh, it's composed most likely around the first or second century CE. I shall sing of night, mother of gods and men. We call night Cypris. She gave birth to all. Hear, O oh blessed goddess, jet black and starlit. For you delight in the quiet and the slumber-filled serenity, cheerful and delightful, lover of the night-long revel. Mother of dreams, you free us from cares, you offer us welcome respite from toil. Giver of sleep, beloved of all, you gleam in the darkness as you drive your steeds, ever incomplete terrestrial and then again celestial. You circle around in pursuit of sprightly phantoms. You force light into the netherworld and then again you flee into Hades. For dreadful necessity governs all things. But now, O blessed one, beatific, desired by all, I call on you to grant a kind ear to my voice of supplication and to come benevolent, to disperse fears that glisten in the night. So when you have some time in your, in your home, in the dark, or, and even when you're in your home in the dark, you can imagine the transparency of the, the walls that are there and be with, your, with the fullness of the place that you are in. But if you're able to, perhaps you can say this prayer looking into those dark, the dark spaces of the sky and see, see what comes. You know, again, have that encounter, feel, feel like it's all right to not know exactly where it's going to go. Give some space and time. You'll see a lot of what I tend to say is this is sort of like the launch code, and then you go off and you have your experience, because that's what's the most fun, the most important. So we get a lot of things, you know, and something I, something I think of specifically for those of us that are in the North, this time of year is associated with the, generically, and I smell campfire, this time of year is associated with dryness and with when with the cold. Um, winter, as we full fledged into winter, we are with the cold and the moist, where that condensing is really happening. But there is something now that happens that is all about you know when the leaves are shedding, which the technical term is abscission, 
when the leaves are are shedding, you know, the, 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 yes, when the leaves are falling away from the trees, I tend to think about how I'm invited to shed, to release, to yield, exfoliate, exuviate, molt, drop, uh, engage in desquamation, and shed, you know, something myself. And I ritualize this a lot, uh, as much as I can by using an exfoliating brush and imagining that as I use that exfoliating brush, that this, whatever is coming forward around the dry and the cold is able to fall away from me. And you'll see there's a, a longer meditation that I will make sure comes out with this and I'll alert you whenever I have a decent recording of it. But again, it comes from Tyson Young Caporta's Sand Talk. It's a, a, in a section called Be Like Your Place. And in that, there's a lot of this idea of shedding and getting rid of this uh, unnecessary um, dead material so that it can kind of return and 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 re re uh engage with the cycles of uh of creation if you will so it becomes nutrient for what is to come and we talked about the sap moving inward and downward and our attention turning towards the root towards sources of warmth and protection and if we think about it the cold time of year was a dangerous time for many of our, and can be still for many contemporary human people, but it was particularly known for its the dangerous qualities that it offered for uh, many of our uh, human person ancestors. And by that I mean that it was often a time that was linked to famine and disease and scarcity. Um, which is maybe why we overhype the outside of the commercialism of it, the indulgence of this time, you know, in many ways is because um, for many of uh, our pre-human, uh, our, our, our human, our human person ancestors, we, it was a tricky time. And you'll see this, there's a video that I'll uh, include below from that uh, conference I went to in, at the Scottish Storytelling Center that's really showing some of the origins of my inspiration for extending the encounter with darkness around this time, but it's a, an academic um, giving a talk called Christmas Goats, Girla, uh, Gurlicks and Skellers, Scott Shetland, Nordic and Gallic Connections. It's a really interesting 45-minute uh, video. If you're interested in um, how people have contemporarily, but also in the not recent past, spent uh, certain ways of times around this time of year, you'll enjoy that. This time of year, uh, because of that, I think, and also because of many other things that will become apparent as we go deeper, is uh, very much tied to a sense of liminality in that um, a lot of the uh, this time of year holds a lot of rituals of reversal and we see that specifically with traditions around halloween where those things that and this does come up in uh that video from the, with that academic the talk that he gave but the idea that those things that we're not able to roam freely amongst the, amongst us are given reign to sort of run roam free freely some uh scholars link it to the idea that the extended period of darkness allows what light keeps trapped into things to come free and because the duration of the night is so much longer they can travel so much further than they would be able to otherwise but the idea that those things that are often hidden to us become visible is a type of inversion. And also, um, if we look at it now, like modern traditions around Halloween, is that literally the children of our families often end up embodying the, the spirits and embodying the spirits of the dead 
who then visit us, and if we do not pay homage to them, we know what might happen. So we see how something that has been laid uh, to a lower state is given such power and importance around this time of year. And these rituals of inversion are not just in those. There are others that happen throughout this time of year, and we'll, we'll talk about a few of them uh, as we go further. But the opportunity that's there is we're literally able to sense into something that is invisible to us normally. Um, and, and a lot of the, the uh, witchcraft traditions I've been involved in in the past, there's a lot of emphasis placed on learning to be initiated by spirit contact, like being able to learn how certain spirits will teach you how to see a spirit's uh, or how to see them better, you know. And a lot of the information I've been given through those encounters is the idea of covering one eye, you know, so you only see with one eye, or taking both eyes and lowering them so that you see this, like, veiled version of seeing. And in seeing that veiled version of seeing, going out into a landscape and moving very slowly and seeing what speaks to you. But uh, some of these themes will come back as we look at some of the, the cultural practices that come out of Scandinavia and Iceland in particular. But the idea that this is a time about sensing the invisible, you know, and being able, and the visible being made visible to us, literally, you know, uh, being an aspect of this time. Um, and something I wanted to delve into now, as we're talking about this, about uh, well, this is that we could say that there is a, a a real rationale to being afraid of the dark, in that we're not sure where the predators are within that dark space. You know, we know for a fact that human being, our vision is quite limited compared to many others. We know that there are animals that hunt at night, and um, it is almost like a rational uh, fear that we have of the dark and, and the predatory qualities that might exist in the dark. And many of us only have to think back to encounters with the dark that we had in childhood or with our own children, perhaps, or children in our lives. To help us to see, you know, that that um, fear is a real thing. Now, um, Gemma Gary, she uh, is a Cornish witch who has written many, many books. Uh, I really like her work. Um, it's like with everything. Some people do, some people don't. But I like what uh, Gemma has done with elaborating on uh, the folkloric sort of like a um, traditional form of witchcraft and has kept moving forward with that. And in a book that she wrote uh, called The Devil's Dozen, which is 13 rites for how to connect with the, um, the devil, if you will, or the idea of the... Um, the Horned One, or however you want him. The blanking on the word that Gemma actually uses in it. But she gives a practice where, uh, and this is not something I would suggest to do in the winter, but more in the warmer months for us. But it's to highlight this particular idea is that she suggests going into uh, a dark space Ideally, I think in the text, she talks about it being in the woods and taking a single lantern or something or flashlight that you go into the woods. And then you have to find a space that is secure enough for you to be able to do this, obviously. But stripping off completely to your bare skin and laying down nude in the dark and switching off uh, the light and keeping your eyes open and being with the darkness in this really intense way. And what she found through doing this practice and, and a few others 
was that uh, something about fear and the way in which fear is moving us towards peak experiences is really important to us having spirit contact. And I'm interested in this idea, you know, that there's not something about banishing the fear of the night, but kind of allowing that fear to catalyze and initiate something for us. So sit with that as you will, you know, I think that uh, there's something definitely there. Uh, and this brings me towards, you know, we're kind of getting towards the last bits of what I wanted to talk about, which is that when we're thinking about the archetypal qualities of darkness and light, we are immediately drawn into a sort of kind of polarization that is the, maybe like the, the er polarization of night and day, you know, light and dark. And I think there is a really binary way of thinking about this. I mean, what I've tried to encourage you to think is to think not just about that, but also about these transition pieces and how the transition pieces are important to what we understand as the fullness of the night. Um, but also the way in which um, I'm my mind goes to this place where dark encounters seem to involve heightened emotional states and fear and anxiety. And there are, a, there is a high level of complicated emotion that is it within the space, is in the space within the darkness um, for many of us. Which again, maybe is why it's so important that we're thinking of those two actions, you know, how we solidify or how we move inwards towards a, a war, a dynamic warmth that's there. And then from there, we're able to journey out into the night because we have that space to sort of return back to um, each time point I was really wanting to get at is that you look at a psychoanalyst like James Hillman and Hillman of course is a Jungian, uh, I think Jungian psych, uh, psychoanalyst invoking the idea of a polytheism uh, as opposed to a monotheism of Jung's ideas of the self being like there's this or form of being called the self that is sort of like the sun and how everything is again simplifying massively sort of orientate orientating itself around this central core uh, that is probably it's everything's origin and maybe where it even returns back to I guess you know as a concept um, but the thing is, is that with Hillman, there's this idea of the polytheism of all of those forms. They are given almost like an agency that exists in and of their own. And I wonder if we were to allow some of this to sit with this fundamental ideal of polarizing night and day. And it is something that I will return to as we move towards the the end of what we're looking at is is um, completing our relationship or finding uh, a, another way of relating to these two things. But again, no answers, just something to to be with. And it does remind me, though, of you know a lot of a lot of times we think of the night as being able to really represent a very powerful form of feminine power within many cultures. And I am interested in the idea of the night and this idea of the grandmother, if you will. And I had a friend, I have a friend, his name is Donald Ingstrom, He's one of my teachers, and he talked about how he had a very powerful relationship with Grandmother Bear. 
And when Grandmother Bear would um, get talk to Donald around this time of year, he, she typically, at least in my understanding of their relationship, would encourage him often to bake pies and eat them and share them with other humans to, to sort of be a way of, again, drawing closer together and being in that warm space. Um, and one day, supposedly, Grandmother Bear, he asked Grandmother Bear maybe why uh, she wanted him to to bake bake so many pies and eat them. <laughs> and she said to him, uh, bake all the pies and eat them, because when you die, you'll, you'll taste all the sweeter. And I think that this is something that is true for us about this primal form of darkness, which is that it is something that is generative and that it gives us space to be born, to be, to emerge, you know, and appear as a thing. But at the same time, it also reminds us always that we shall return to it uh, inevitably, completely. Um, and you can see this within many different cultures. Uh, we can think of Kali, for example. Um, but we can think of many different God forms that sort of have this truth that they are ferociously protective of their babies, but they also eat them, you know, um, again, food for thought, <laughs> when you become food for thought. So to end, let's look at some other practical things that one can get up to. One, um, as you, in my quest to always make these things more place orientated, start seeking out the dark in your place. And by that I mean we can look at any form of dark. What is the not, what is the less visible elements within your own home? You know, where is there darkness like more readily and more naturally than anywhere else? What are the, um, places within your landscape you know are there any caverns that that are present within your like the two two mile three mile radius around your home are there any old trees that have like fascinating holes in them another one because i do think that the ancient aligns really well with the dark and the night there's almost like there's more there to sort of again like that this rift, the dark rift in the Milky Way is so packed with uh, material that it appears black to us, you know, and obscures the light. We can almost start to find places within our landscapes that are the oldest things that we are able to, to tap into. You know, where's the oldest, oldest man-made building? like the oldest trees, where's the place that you can come into contact with the oldest stones within your area, you know? And it doesn't have to be any um, any place in particular. It doesn't have to be like the oldest of the oldest, but I think knowing that it is an old place with the oldest cemetery, you know, within your landscape, find those old places. Last little bit. This is more about my my encouragement for you while if you are in the north hemisphere to get outside and be with the sky. And the reason that is because the sky is so much there's so much more time to be with the sky now than there is in the winter, particularly if you're in the farther areas of the north. Like when I up here, it starts to get dark really early now and it starts to brighten up super early as well. My point is, is that this is a remarkable time to be with uh, the night sky. Similarly, the path of the planets, the ecliptic, what you'll notice is that during the day in the north, if you're in the north, uh, and it'll be reversed for you if you're in the south, you know, but this pattern still holds, in the cold time of year, the dark time of year, the path of the sun, the ecliptic that it moves across the zodiac is actually very close to the horizon, you know? So the sun in midwinter, it really only like 
comes up along the horizon of your super far north and then sort of shows like it's setting um, and always burning in the um, sorry in the summer you'll see that but um, in the winter it'll come up and it'll hug the horizon and then it disappears again um, but simultaneously what this means is that the path of the planets as the night comes forth that arc is very high in the sky so when any stars that are showing like their faces at night or any planets that are showing their, their light at night and particularly when the moon is showing herself in the winter sky she will ride higher than she will ride all year long so this is a really powerful time to see this, the planets while they're way high up in the sky um, and right now, in most places, you can see Saturn and Jupiter. And then in particular, uh, right now, we have an amazing ability to counter Venus. In her evening star expression, she's just reached the, the point of greatest elongation, where she's the furthest away from the sun she's going to get. And she's only going to get higher and brighter for a little while until she turns uh, retrograde and goes uh, closer to the sun, of course, and disappears. Um, which is is happening um, towards the very end of this year. My point is is that all of these moments that you have to be with the night sky, they are all opportunities for you to learn directly from the horse's mouth, if you will, about the power of the night. And I'd encourage you to do this, you know, if you have the capacity to be able to do it. And one thing that is interesting, if we add some other things that will come up more whenever we're looking at it from an astrological lens, is that um, Venus, as an example, is in the waning aspect of her phase. The Venus actually shows different phases. Uh, and now um, Venus sort of passed her full, full, full Venus phase and is waning in light. Um, will get a little brighter, believe it or not. Her um, the magnitude that she glows at will get brighter as she moves further into her waning phase, which is interesting. But there's less light that she's showing the Earth as we go forward. There's something about the waning aspect of the planets, including the moon, that is tied more readily to the night and the outbreath. So that all being said, if you look to a planet like Venus now, where she's showing um, a queen of the evening sky in her waning phase, it's a fascinating moment, especially while she's in Capricorn. And the reason I highlight this is because the nocturnal signs are the water and earth signs. So any planet, if, if you're thinking about in your own chart, some place to play a little bit and think about where is the night in your chart, look to what planets or points are associated with the water and earth signs, which are the nocturnal signs. Similarly, you could also look to, are any of those nocturnal planets, and by that I mean uh, in the classical way of thinking about it, with the Moon, Venus, and Mars, or evening star Mercury, if you have evening star Mercury. But similarly, any planet that is in an evening phase could be a nighttime expression of that planet, particularly if it's in uh, a water or Earth sign. So I'll leave you with that. Got a lot of stuff to play with. Uh, I'll probably insert now like some sort of Praxis slide that you can grab and maybe also have it uh, below the video. Thank you all very much. Um, really appreciate your attention and your time. And if you ever feel like you're in a position to give to support this being available to everyone, please feel free to uh, to, to offer what you can. Uh, and also the readings, the consults of all kinds, they're also always there. If you decide that some one-on-one -on -one, uh, time would be really good. Until then, speak soon.